welcome to Toyota Time with Timmy the Toll Man and Sean. Today, what we have for you is not so much a how-to video, but it's more of a show and tell because we already have a couple of videos in existence for installing transmission coolers on Toyota vehicles. The first one I did was on my 2000 Toyota 4Runner and I installed a B&M cooler, this exact same one, and ran it in series with the transmission cooler in the bottom of the radiator. And I installed the same B&M transmission cooler on my 98 4Runner. Over time, with my 98 4Runner, that's the one that's heavily modified with bumpers and armor and winch and all kinds of other mods I've done to it. So when I go up mountain passes, when I'm four wheeling, the transmission is straining a lot harder than it does with my 2000 4Runner that's mostly stock. So what I found is the transmission temperature could go pretty damn high, higher than I would like to see. I talked with my buddy Anwar that knows a lot about Toyotas and does a lot of his own wrenching himself and wrenching on other people's vehicles. And he told me that he has a cooler that he really likes. And I took his advice and I first installed one of these coolers. It's a Hayden 699 cooler. It's a really big cooler with a lot of cooling capacity. And I installed it on my buddy Ray's FJ Cruiser. And after I learned how well his transmission temperature was doing on his FJ Cruiser, I decided I would install it on my 98 4Runner and see how well it does for me. So I removed the B&M cooler, which I had affixed using the zip tie method where you push the zip ties through the AC condenser and through the radiator and you fix it that way. I got rid of this and then I installed the Hayden 699 cooler with brackets just like I did on Ray's FJ Cruiser because I think it's better to use the brackets than to use the zip ties through your AC condenser and radiator because if those zip ties aren't really tight there is a chance that you can damage your AC condenser or your radiator and then it could potentially leave you stuck. If one of your radiator coolant channels fractures and then you have a leak and then you're stuck out there in BFE, which wouldn't be a good thing. Or you ruin your AC condenser and now you have no air conditioning and you're gonna have to replace the AC condenser. So the safer way is use the brackets, but it is more time consuming because you have to figure out how to bend the brackets and how you're gonna attach it to the front of the vehicle. So. That's the downside of using the brackets. On this install, I decided to bypass the stock cooler in the bottom of the radiator because the Hayden 699 cooler has a built-in pressure bypass, meaning when the fluid is colder and thicker, it's not gonna flow through all the possible cooling channels it can. It's gonna bypass and just go in the inlet and directly out the outlet and not go through all the cooling channels until the fluid gets hotter and thins out and then it will get optimum cooling from that cooler. That's the best way I can explain it, that when the fluid is thicker, the pressure bypass isn't gonna allow the fluid to go through all the cooling channels that it can go through and thus it's not gonna keep your fluid abnormally cool because of that. It's gonna help your transmission get up to optimal temperature faster than if you didn't have that pressure bypass. So I blabbed enough, let's get out to the truck and I'll show you where I installed this Hayden 699 cooler on the front of my rig. I've got the grill disconnected from the front of the vehicle so we can show you how we installed the cooler. Here's the cooler right here and you can see how we mounted it. What we had to do to make room for it is normally you're gonna have one of your horns affixed right here with this 12 millimeter bolt. And that was getting in the way of us being able to fit this cooler in here. So where we relocated it is right here. We just shared the same bolt hole for the hood latch mechanism and we mounted it here. We had to extend the cable length a little bit. So what I did is I cut the plug and I butt spliced in some longer wires and I ran it to where we can plug it in right here. So it was just a simple two wire plug cut them, strip the wires, put butt connectors on, or you could solder and then routed it over to here. And so now I have both my horns basically on the passenger side of the front of the vehicle. You can see how we mounted this thing. A lot of the holes we used were holes that were already there and we're sharing them with other things. So right here on the top left, 
we're sharing this 10 millimeter bolt hole for this vertical cross member in front of the AC condenser. And we made this bracket by just putting a slight S bend into it and it worked out pretty well. It's nice and close to this vertical cross member, but it's not touching. On this bottom left one right here, we decided to drill a hole in this cross member because we wanted to be able to have easy access to be able to put the bolts in. There is an existing hole down here on this cross member, but the winch is in the way and it would be really hard to get that bolt in and tightened. This bracket is again, just a little bit of an S bend, a little bit of an offset, and we bolted it right here. On this upper right connection, we share this bolt hole. This is part of the bracketry that holds the AC condenser to the body. We affixed the bracket here and then it goes to one of the top holes right here. It was the easiest bracket we made for this install. With this bottom right connection, we used the bottom radiator bolt on the driver's side. So what we did is we basically made a U-shaped bracket with a little bit of a twist in it in order to affix it here. That's the four brackets that we had to make. You'll notice that there's a little bit of metal removed here and I decided to take a Dremel tool with a little grinder wheel and grind out a little bit of area here so it would be easier to get onto these 7 16 bolt heads with a socket. Without taking a little metal out, you can't really get the socket on there. It's kind of tedious and hard to be able to tighten these with just open end wrenches. So I decided to open up the metal just a little bit to where I can get a socket on there. So as you can see, the install turned out pretty damn well. I had my buddy Ton helping me and I think we did a pretty bang up job of getting this thing fixed really well within the space available. So when you're installing this, mainly what you want to make sure you do is that you don't have it to where the cooler can rub up against anything metal. So we were really careful when we were making the brackets to make sure that the cooler wouldn't be contacting any part of the body. So over time, if there was a little bit of rubbing happening, it could wear a hole in the cooler and cause it to fail. And that would be a bad thing. So just make sure if you're going to follow our lead and install it with brackets, just be really careful and take your time in making your brackets to where the cooler is sitting suspended away from anything metal. One helpful tool that Ton came up with while we were making the brackets is he took one of the brackets out of the kit that I bought and he traced it on some cardboard. He cut it out and he also colored in where all the holes were. So when you're trying to figure out how to bend the bracket to make it work for the connection you're working on, it's nice to be able to use the cardboard one. You could bend it to where it looks like it's going to work for you and then you can take that cardboard version of the bracket and then mark up your metal one and then you'll know where you need to make the bends and how you need to make the bends. So that was a nice thing that Ton came up with. Let me give you a visual of how this B&M cooler that I was originally using and compare it to the Hayden 699 cooler. You can see that the B&M cooler is much thicker but it's not nearly as wide. Like if I put this up to the Hayden cooler, you could see how much wider the Hayden cooler is from the B&M cooler. The way I think this Hayden cooler is going to be an upgrade in cooling capacity over this B&M cooler is because look how many cooling channels there are and look how many cooling fins there are. Even though this B&M cooler has some big wide channels, you can see that the cooling capacity isn't going to be as much as it would be for this Hayden one because you have a lot more cooling channels and you have a lot more cooling fins, thus more cooling capacity for the fluid. It's going to be maximized with this design as compared to this B&M design because there's not as many cooling channels and not as many cooling fins to cool off the fluid. Now let's go underneath the vehicle and I'll show you how I ran the hoses. Let me start off by showing you the cooler lines on the passenger side of the transmission. The rear line is the return line and the more forward line is the send line. It sends the hot fluid to the cooler to be cooled and then it returns on the rear or lower line. So now we'll move forward and I'll show you how the hoses route. To give you a little bit of orientation, here's the bottom of the radiator on the passenger side. Here's a power steering hard line right here. Up above here, this is your AC compressor. And right below the AC compressor, 
you have two metal lines that run underneath it. The metal line that's a little bit higher and closer to the passenger side, that is the send line. And then the one that's a little bit lower and more towards the center of the vehicle, that is the return line. So the metal hard line turns into a rubber line and you're gonna see that I have this brass T connection. And what this is, if you're familiar with our channel, I installed an aftermarket transmission temperature gauge on this 98 Forerunner because the 98 Forerunner doesn't offer transmission temperature through the OBD2 port. So that's what this is. It's allowing a sensor to plug into the send line so I could accurately read my transmission temperature. In a stock rig, this rubber line would run right to this passenger side port on the bottom of the radiator. This is the transmission cooler. It would run through the transmission cooler in the bottom of the radiator and then it would exit this port on the driver's side. This line would return right back to this bottom metal connection underneath the AC compressor. But with the cooler install, it's gonna be different now. This send line is routing towards the driver's side and it's gonna go through the body and then it's gonna attach to the bottom port of the transmission cooler. The fluid enters the bottom fitting on the cooler and then it leaves the top fitting. On a sideways mounting of a transmission cooler, they recommend that you fill from the bottom and exit out the top because of the concern that air can be trapped inside the cooler and it could limit the efficiency of the cooling capacity because air is occupying some of the area where fluid could potentially flow and be cooled. Because air rises, if it fills from the bottom and exits out the top, it will push the trapped air out of it. That's the theory. So that's why they say fill from the bottom and exit out the top. So once the fluid goes through the cooler, it leaves the top port and it goes back through this body hole on the driver's side. You can see that I used some heater hose to protect the lines from abrasion. This part of the body could be pretty sharp and so I don't want the cooler lines to be severed and cause a leak. So this is three quarter inch heater hose that I slipped over the 3 8 transmission cooler hose. So now that the fluid has left the cooler, it's gonna go back through this hose and then on its way back, I decided to install a magnifying magnetic filter to help with the filtration of the fluid. So this way I'll never have to worry about the transmission filter underneath the pan ever becoming clogged because this thing is adding a lot of extra filtration. These filters are rated to last for 30,000 miles. So they are a nice addition and you want to make sure you install it correctly so it has an arrow with the proper flow direction. The fluid is flowing back to the transmission so it's flowing from left to right coming from the cooler. So you have to make sure you get it in the right orientation. If you decided you wanted to add this style of filter on the send line, then you would have to have it to where the flow is flowing towards the transmission cooler. So you just have to make sure you understand how the fluid is flowing and get the filter in the right orientation. You can see that I use some abrasion protection right here using the three quarter inch heater hose. Use zip ties to zip tie the filter and both of the hoses to these metal power steering lines that run in front of this cross member right here. I suggest you do something similar. Anywhere your transmission cooler lines are gonna be rubbing up against something, you'll want to use some abrasion protection like this three quarter inch heater hose. And then it's just nice to secure the lines so they're not flopping around. So the lines are nice and secured all throughout their path. So then it exits the filter and it goes back to that metal hard line that's the lower and closer to the driver's side metal hard line and it returns back to the transmission and that is the full routing of the fluid from the transmission to the cooler and back to the transmission when you decide to bypass a good thing to do is to cap off these ports so what i did is i took some 3 8 transmission hose and i just connected 
this passenger side port to the driver side port. And the reason why you wanna do that is say for instance, if the transmission cooler in the bottom of the radiator did crack, then it's potentially an area to where coolant can leak out of your radiator. So by joining the two ports with this 3 8 inch transmission cooler hose, even if the transmission cooler does crack, the coolant can't leak out of the radiator because the path for it to leak out has been blocked by the hose. So if you're gonna bypass, I highly recommend that you cap off these lines. All right, I'm all done with my show and tell of the Hayden 699 transmission cooler on my 98 Forerunner. Usually with the videos we make, we always do a detailed step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step of how you accomplish it. But with these transmission cooler installs, most of your time is figuring out, number one, where you're gonna mount it, then number two, figuring out how you're gonna make the brackets to work to where you can mount it where you want it, and then number three is figuring out how you're gonna run the lines from the transmission cooler hard lines to the external cooler and then back to the transmission. And it would be pretty much a boring thing to watch because you would basically be seeing Ton and I figuring out how we're gonna bend the brackets and it wouldn't be that stimulating for you. So with that said, I still think this video is gonna be helpful to those of you that wanna add a cooler to your third generation 4Runner or maybe a first generation Tacoma because they have the same engine and same front end. So there it is there. I hope this video helps you install an aftermarket transmission cooler on your third generation 4Runner or first gen Tacoma. With all that said, we thank you for watching Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean and the very helpful help for Ton. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you have any questions or comments, do that below. Take care. Bye-bye. Sick mods and sick external transmission cooler installs on a third generation Toyota Forum. Peace out. Happy wrenching. Bye-bye.